Hello and welcome to the NCCCA panel discussion of the new documentary, Public Trust. We are honored to have two special guest panelists today, Hal Herring and Angela Baca, both whom are prominently featured in this important film. My name is Merrill Leeds and I'm a volunteer with the North County Climate Change Alliance. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the NCCCA is a local San Diego-based nonprofit dedicated to raising climate awareness and bringing about action through education, collaboration, and mobilization. A few very quick announcements before we get started. First off, <clears throat> I'd like to thank all of the folks who worked so hard to make these events a reality, including Lily Fleschler from Picture Motion, NCCCA board members, Marion Cedio, thank you, Marion, Elizabeth Mosley, Suzanne Ryan, and in particular for this event, Jay Kloppenstein, who brought this film screening opportunity to our attention. Thanks, Jay. Please mark your calendars for the following upcoming events. On Thursday, September 10th, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, we invite you to attend Earth's Climate Crisis and What to Do About It with Dr. William Calvin from the University of Washington. And on Thursday, October 8th, 5 p.m. Pacific time, we will be hosting Pain into Action with Dr. Margaret Klein Salomon. Please visit our website, nccalliance.org to register. Finally, Angelo Baca will tell you more about a special event going on later today um, related to today's film. Here's a little bit about our panelists. Hal Herring is an award-winning journalist and contributing editor to at Field and Stream magazine. A lifelong outdoorsman, mountaineer, hunter, and fisherman based in Augusta, Montana, quote, my passions as a writer and storyteller lie where they always have, in exploring humankind's evolving relationship to the natural world and all the failures, successes, and deep tensions inherent in that relationship. Angela Baca is a Navajo and Hopi filmmaker and PhD candidate in sociocultural anthropology at NYU. A graduate of the Native Voices program at the University of Washington, he has created numerous documentaries and collaborative works around such subjects as indigenous food sovereignty, native youth development, and indigenous international repatriation. Please welcome Hal, Angelo, and Carl Aldinger, the NCCCA president and today's discussion moderator. Thanks, Merrill. Can you guys hear me? So I, I apologize, my uh, video is a little monkey, uh, messed up today, excuse me, uh, because what happened is uh, we're having internet outages here. And uh, for folks that are not coming from Southern California or California in general, we are uh, experiencing super high heats today. Um, we're we're planned to have 106 degrees here in Fallbrook, um, which is in the North County of San Diego. Um, so I guess we should all anticipate that as the climate warms up, uh, we will be having more and more instances of rolling blackouts. And of course this affects our internet infrastructure as well. So I'm coming to you via cell phone. So I apologize if I break up here. This is the first time my internet's been so failed. Um, in the months that I've been doing Zoom work here uh, from home. So uh, thank you, Hal and Angelo, for joining us today. Um, and thank you all of, all of you from the NCCCA uh, community. And then I, I know we've been drafting in folks from outside of our local community to come to these two. So uh, we really appreciate everyone's involvement here. I'd like to ask you to all put your questions in the comment uh, section in the chat box. Um, and I'll try to follow along with that, and uh, I will moderate those questions. Uh, we just find this is a, uh, a nice way to work with our guests and make sure that we're asking them questions that are pretty relevant to the film and to their background. Um, so I want to start off by um, getting some background uh, in relation to the film and how and Angelo's roles um, because it would be really easy for us to slip in and start saying, why did you choose to do this in the film or do that in the film? Um, and I think it's probably a, a little bit of a complex backstory as to what your two involvements were in the film. So could you give us some idea of 
um, how you participated in the making of the film, uh, which parts of it were your narratives, uh, your stories, um, even your, your content, um, because that'll help us to understand better about uh, how you can speak to how the film um, is framed. You can start off with, uh, with Angela. So um, thank you, first of all, for the invitation and I appreciate uh, everyone's willingness to join on a holiday weekend. I know there's a lot of things people could be doing right now. Um, but to start off things right, um, you know, what we have to do is first, you know, acknowledge whose land we're on, right? And we should acknowledge who we are and where we come from. And, um, you know, when we have our traditional introductions in Navajo, we basically are stating our kinship networks and saying who our family is and where we're from. And also wrapped within that, usually the landscape, the geography, the area of the place that we're in, that we're from. So I would introduce myself in my language. So I say, Angelo Baca, Yenishye. Hello, my name's Angelo. Uh, then I'd introduce my clans. Um, so I, I'm saying that I'm here in the area of Bears Ears and, you know, uh, I'm of the people, Dene. And that's acknowledgement to all my lineage, all my ancestry and the landscape. And what I would like to see happening in organizations like this, because they love the land so much, is that they start conversations with indigenous communities that have been there since time immemorial. So acknowledging the Kumie peoples there and all those folks who are of those bands, um, especially along the border with San Diego and California and Mexico. Um, I've had a great mentor who's Kumie. I've had a student who's Kumie who unfortunately was killed in a, uh, on the street in an urban confrontation. I've worked with native youth who have been trying their best to survive in those inner cities and also know who they are with their culture, their language, their heritage and where they come from. And so I would be not doing the justice if I didn't acknowledge them because they made me who I am. And what I would like to see is everybody here step that up and take that into their work when they do conservation, environmental protection, is to consult and build meaningful relationships with those native communities, invite them to this table, have these conversations. Ideally, it would be one of them here speaking in front of, in front of this instead of me, or at least co-hosting this together because we're in, we're in their house, you're just guests there. So when I speak about this stuff, you know, it's not about um, trying to shame or blame anyone or point it out. It's about trying to raise everybody's game that we're not having the same conversation that we had a few years ago, even last year, even a few months ago. Things are different now and we've seen that with leadership, with the protests, with the dire situation that we're in with climate change and with our federal agencies basically waging war on our public lands. You know, it's time to change direction drastically. And it goes all goes back to the land. And you can't talk about the land without talking about the original people. So I just want to acknowledge them and acknowledge that the privilege and the power, the resources that we have here are extensive and that we should be able to utilize that for better purposes and that we can do better and that all of you are here because you love the land and so i'm trying to show you another way that we can we can protect you know our places our people for future generations and that's what i wanted to do to start this conversation out right correctly first and foremost thanks angelo and i apologize for not um doing that so you, you're you're right, and that is something that we need to work at. So thank you for pointing that out. Did you wanna um, did you wanna have uh, some words to start with, Hal, as well, before we jump into the questions? Because I, I really didn't give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves. Um, I don't I don't have too much. I I mean, uh, my involvement in the film came uh, because I was uh, I had done a previous film with David Byers, who was the director, um, and uh, we had met through these kind of 
at the Malheur uh, Refuge Occupation in um, Oregon um, on a public lands thing with the Bundy occupation of that, the Bundy family. Um, but to, uh, and I, I've just been a writer on these issues for about 22 years. Um, so I had some, I had some uh, baggage to bring to this, hopefully positive baggage. Um, but um, to speak to what Al Angelo was saying there, um, I got, I think that the, the, absolutely the best thing that happened to me being involved in this film project was to meet uh, Angelo and his mother, um, to spend some time with the Gwich'in um, in Fort Yukon, Alaska, um, to get a uh, indigenous perspective on stuff that I had, uh, I, I freely admit that I had been working on for 22 years and missed a huge, I, I knew about it, but I didn't have good knowledge of, um, of what we were talking about um, with public lands and our history there and our future there. And so um, spending this time with Angelo um, and other indigenous like, like spokespeople, um, I got more out of this film experience than I put in, I can tell you that. And I was missing, I was missing a key piece. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, that's, as Angela said, that's going to be an important part of what we reflect on when we look back on 2020. Um, it's looked at as a time of uh, tremendous um, despair, really. But, um, but I think it, history will tell a different tale that um, we changed a lot of minds and the narrative. Um, and I do appreciate that. Um, this film tried to do that. Um, Angelo, do you have uh, any perspectives on whether or not um, it, it served that purpose well in really describing the indigenous um, original ownership, or I shouldn't say ownership, but original um, space in the lands? Um, I think that's an interesting question because, um, you know, I was trying to work with David and Jeremy for a while and, um, you know, it's interesting to see what it would look like if I hadn't worked with them so early on uh, because they were doing their best to be responsive, to be culturally sensitive, to be um, actually meaningfully engaged. Um, but um, it was severely limited. I mean, whenever you make a film, there's always multiple hands that are involved in it, and it's not the original vision that you had hoped for. Uh, for instance, we had a great interview with one of the Navajo uranium miners here in the community, and unfortunately, that was on the cutting room floor, and that was the one piece I didn't want on the cutting room floor, because, you know, we're, we're talking about a guy's life, and like, he can't get off of his ventilator for more than 15 minutes or, or he's in trouble and he only had like 10 minutes to talk to us you know that's that is significant as an effort as a respect to my elders as somebody who has lived it and has survived and is literally giving us the message that this is dangerous to human beings to land to plants to animals air water and i just was kind of really disappointed in that. And there were a few things, other concessions and compromises that had to be made. But I understand what the, the goal and the purpose of this film is, which is really one, to educate and two, to mobilize. You know, if we look at this film next year, we could see how dated it is because it's right in the throes of this current administration and all the things that are happening, you know, uh, with great urgency that we have to inform ourselves and then act. So um, knowing that and going into it, you know, it, you just kind of have to be okay with some of the things that are, are being made. I know if it was done from an indigenous perspective or a different point of view, it'd obviously be very different. But, you know, I understand that it's brought a lot of people together and it's brought them up to speed and it's introduced this idea of like conversating with our communities. And I think indigenous people are key to that because we are on the forefront everywhere, protecting these lands for all generations. And I think that's one of the things, if people look at it, um, you know, it is limited in its mission, but it's doing a good job at its limited mission. So it's not a bad thing. It actually is, is very good. Like Hal said, 
we've started to formulate more relationships and more connections to other folks. And so we plan on keeping that going. Great, thank you. Um, the, as you just mentioned, the, the movie was probably started a few years ago and wrapped up um, a little while ago because there's always that timing between when you film and, and produce the film and then get it out. Um, would you guys like to catch us up on- yeah, a, pres pres a preservation uh, Zoom meeting that I was, that started at um, 10 and uh, okay. going to see what we'll pick up. Sorry, um, can you guys catch us up a little bit on the status of Bears Ears um, and the various places that were under attack, Anwar, um, in the film? Because I feel like um, th there could have been some changes that have happened since the film ended that we might be um, completely unaware of having just seen the film. Angela, will you go first on Bears Ears and, and uh, Grand Staircase? And I was hoping you would do the opposite. Um, <laughs> mostly because my stuff is real brief, right? Because we're still in the throes of litigation and a lot of that stuff you can't really talk about. Um, so it's in the process right now with the courts because the, you know, the administration's getting sued by various entities. But um, all I can say about it really is it's looking pretty um, optimistic right now because we, we understand that certain people have taken certain positions in seeing the areas restored. And it's gonna take a lot more work to do that because um, obviously there's uh, gonna be a whole new group of people to like form those working relationships with and understand where each other's position is and where they come from. But um, I think a lot of folks are just really um, looking forward to the future. And even though it does seem like, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of issues to be worried about all the time. Um, one thing that we're not worried about is the land because the land's always going to be there. The, the mountains, the canyons, the rivers, I, it's, you know, um, and this is home and we're always going to be at home, no matter what designation people give it, um, from, from our viewpoint, uh, this is where we're at. We're not going anywhere. So we keep the long view <laughs> in perspective. So um, I think kind of like this discussion and the film itself is really kind of focusing on that short view, which is, which is good too. Um, so yeah, Hal? Um, yeah, that's I'm, well said because the, we, need, we need the land. The land doesn't need us. I mean, I, well, maybe it does. I mean, you know what I mean? It may, I think it does. But um, the, as you said, the land has been there since time memorial, and it'll be there when we're specs, you know. Um, but uh, I, I do. So in, in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the 1002 area, I wish Bernadette were here to speak to this, um, which is Bernadette from, from uh, Fort Yukon. But uh, they are leasing for uh, drilling rights in the 1002 area. Uh, and again, that's been something that uh, so-called, uh, I, I call it a petrocracy, the, the petro uh, takeover of government where you capture the, an, an industry captures government and then uses government um, to do what it wants, right? Uh, to siphon away taxpayer money to, to, it's called rent seeking actually, if David Byers gave you that term, um, but uh, which is something to Google if you're watching this um, and, and check out how absolutely relevant the term rent seeking is to our system of government at this moment. But I have, a, I have something that I, I, I have absolutely learned this in the last year since the film was put in the can. Um, we, the, the administration we have now is not any different in its approach to land issues than the Bush 43 ish, than the Bush 43 administration was. It is simply much more in your face about it, much more uh, actually honest about it. We're gonna do this. What we're being asked in the last year is who we are as a people. Who are Americans and what will they take? What will they stand for? What do they want? What do we want? 
And um, in that way, Angelo said something about there are a lot of people feeling optimistic or whatever about about the monument rescissions and the, and the fight against, you know, to restore the monuments. I feel like a lot of people are feeling very optimistic, and I know that's going to sound weird to people, but we are being asked what it is we want our country to be by this administration in a way that in all of my life I've never seen before. And if, if we accept the, the destruction of our national monuments, if we accept the drilling or the leasing in the 1002 area at a time when petroleum is at rock bottom prices, um, then we will have said what, what it is that we, we want for the future. We want a future of pillage and, and uh, you know, uh, lost resources and, and senseless drilling for a product that's not particularly in demand. Um, we're just being asked who it is we, we want to be. And um, I think we can all, I think we can work with that. So while we're on the subject of representation and, and we're uh, kind of diving into the politics a little bit, because the, the film did a good job of balancing um, the conservation um, and the need to keep these lands uh, wild, but it also talks in a pretty distressing way about how our representation is not doing what is right for the um, preservation. Um, and I thought it was interesting that the narrative we saw was that sort of Congress was failing throughout the Obama administration. Um, I think it, it sort of showed how President Obama at the last minute, the end of his administration came in and declared some of these spaces, national monuments, uh, save the day um, in the way that other presidents had done using the Antiquities Act. Um, and. Uh, we're seeing that uh, this idea of presidential decree is not as viable as we had thought it was. In other words, Trump administration seems to have been able to unwind that regardless. It's the first time um, people have just thumbed their nose at the Antiquities Act. It doesn't matter. We're going to go our own way. Um, so a couple questions. Uh, do you feel like there's a need for us to uh, work in a much different way in conservation than to keep relying on presidential decree on monuments? I think the the movie sort of says that in a subtle way, but I think it's worth uh, stating out loud. And then um, another question uh, for you, maybe Hal, you have a, a unique perspective on this. I hear a lot of conversations about uh, we're not equally representative based on our populations. And California has so many more people, so we deserve more senators or something like that. Or, um, But I, I think uh, we should also understand that opposite narrative or thought perspective of you know, it, it may take at least two senators that are doing the right thing, which we don't always see um, in uh, Montana or in, in Alaska, some of these places with lower populations where they really need representation at the federal level. So I wonder if you two can weigh in on um, some of the politics of this and where you see us going to, to do better. I'll, I'll, I can do that. Um, I just, uh, you know, we still have a representative democratic republic in the United States of America for all our failings, for all our, our, our despair, whatever. We still have it. We're getting the representation that we choose. And um, one of the problems that we have is if you go back to the George Bush administration, for instance, and, and, and you look at how the environment polled in 2004 after four years of, of truly bad environmental policy on the federal level, you know, it pulled at 4%. That's what, that's what the interest of the American voter was in the environment, without which nobody does anything, by the way. You don't have dirt, you don't have water, you, you know, you're not going to be boating or dancing or anything else. So we as a people were resting on the laurels of 1972 through 1980 or whatever, when we achieved a lot of enviable environmental protection on the federal level. And resting on those laurels, those laurels have collapsed. Okay. And so the American people are going to have to say what they want. And I'm hoping that they're going to want the Antiquities Act to, to establish protected areas like the Bears Ears. Um, but when what you said was presidential decrees are very weak. 
and and our 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 uh, government is designed so that the president can't be a, a lunatic doing whatever, and the people have to say now. We we had a time where it, things were kind of getting better, but now the people are going to have to choose this, and. I would say that Bears Ears, the waters of the U.S. rule, all of that should have gone through Congress and good congressmen voted in by us would have made that choice and made that executive decree unnecessary. And that's what we're going to do in the future. The, the people are going to demand this. They're going to demand watershed protection and climate action. And the, and the representatives in Congress will be tossed out if they don't deliver what the people demand. So that's where I'm at. Okay, Hal, so I appreciate that, um, that movement from talking about our representatives and um, how they're failing us and how the people need to push our representatives. Um, and so Angelo, uh, can you talk a little bit about the intertribal gathering? Um, it was covered a little bit in the film um, and I think it showed that it was an important force in Bears Ears but you were right there in the middle of it, um, I think. And if you could give us some perspective of what it was like to be um, a filmmaker, um, it sounds like you're involved directly in some of the litigation, um, maybe as an activist or an advocate or a witness. So can you let us know um, how that experience went and how important it is for the communities to do this work to push the legislators? Yeah, let me also respond to the previous question because when you say representation, automatically we go to two different things. Um, and, I, and I just sent the media orientation guide that we developed here with our organization, our indigenous led nonprofit conservation organization. We found that people were making terrible mistakes in reporting about Bears Ears, um, often stereotypical and racist narratives. And so we made a direct intervention in which this sheet would guide reporters into asking the right questions, the right terminology, the right history. And I think every conservation group should do this in the place that they live with their own native community. And I think that it's a battle to go back and forth and figure out how to do that narrative um, collaboration together in a better way. And the reporter section is the most interesting part if you look at it, because really that's applicable to everybody. That's applicable to scholars, researchers, filmmakers, artists, musicians, reporters, and conservation folks, outdoor retailer people, folks that we are just barely now forming these relationships with. They have to figure out how to approach each other with respect and on equal terms. And I think that's really important because representation means impacting narratives. Narratives means impacting the record and impacting the record means actual policy and legislation reform. So all of it is connected and all of it's super important. And, um, you know, I would say that when we screened this film for the first time in Montana, um, the audiences were pretty bright and intelligent. They knew, you know, that this film had a purpose, that they had intelligent questions about, you know, why, why we're seeing what we're seeing on the film, on the screen. But their next question was, okay, so we vote. So we change leadership. What next? You know, it's the whole question is, so what, now what? And I was like, I'm glad you asked that question because the next thing is to, act, is to work with native communities in protecting these lands. And I think that's the pushback that a lot of people are getting, right? Is you have the federal agencies wanting to do certain things like designate monuments, and then you have locals wanting to do certain things like we want to sell this land and privatize it or whatever. So there's this narrative of like federal people against local people. But you know what, the indigenous people are the ultra local people. They're the hyper local people. They're the ones there before any of this. So if you really look at it, when people make these claims like, oh, my family's been ranching this thing for several generations or whatever, it's like, really? Because mine have been in this place for several thousand generations and they're in the dirt and they're here before you and you get to benefit off of that. So let's have that hard conversation. And I think that's where it needs to go because, you know, when we talk about the intertribal coalition, this has never happened before. The five tribes of the coalition have always fought each other, but they unified in solidarity and unity to protect this land. That's how important it is. All that historical baggage left at the door, it comes in with one mind, one heart. 
And that's what the impetus of this monument is. And I think that gets lost in all of these narratives. It gets swallowed up in public lands debates and national monument stuff and administration politics. And people rarely look at what is the core reason that this is important to us? Why is it culturally and spiritually significant? So those are, those are the different questions we should be asking ourselves and of each other. Because if you know these places are America's you know, best idea, well, let's make them America's better idea. And you can do that, you know, and it starts with you. Thanks, Angelo. Um, this is probably a good time for me to ask a question and I apologize, this is uh, putting you on the spot and it's a very personal thing. Um, but I wanted to talk about that term BIPOC, um, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, it's a term that's being used now. Um, and I first saw it coming from people with uh, very honest intentions of doing the right thing to correct injustices. Um, and so I personally think that it's a good thing. But I want to hear your perspective on whether um, using that term BIPOC uh, is really helpful to raise the um, understanding of where Indigenous peoples um, have been wronged in the past and where uh, where they belong in this, these conversations about how we uh, change our intentions and how we change our policies. I mean, I'm glad that people are taking a hard look at themselves organizationally, institutionally about, you know, what that means. Um, I think the danger is that you could see it like anything else, you know, BIPOC could be DEI and you can just slap that on and say, yeah, we're doing diversity, equity, and inclusion without actually doing the work. You know, you can't just check the box and then assume that everything is good. This is an actual like reevaluation of everybody's values, their, you know, their core objectives, what their uh, real limitations are on inclusivity in an equal and respectful way. And um, it's important to acknowledge that. I think that, you know, the boundary setting is, is a work in progress and people are figuring out how to actually talk and engage with us. Um, you know, uh, I'm working on a film now that has to do with the 1978 Anneth oil field takeover. And, you know, what's interesting to me is that, you know, that was a successful takeover by a Navajo people of oil executive headquarters here, just in our county in 1978, but nobody knew about it. We didn't have social media, we didn't have filmmakers, we didn't have like press people covering this stuff. I've only seen it mentioned a couple times in other works. So I'm covering the story, but everybody knows about Standing Rock. Everyone knows about Bears Ears. Everyone knows about Mauna Kea. But just because a movement happens in the dark, does that mean no one hears it? Because it worked, you know? And I think those are the really key issues where why are we at where we're at? We have to go all the way back into the history and figure out some kind of like historical justice that can be served for every community. And, you know, I really think like that's the hard work. When we say Bears Ears is healing, it is because we're talking about healing historical trauma. And there is no place for us in American society. There's no organizations for that. There's no designated people or times or things in which we can do that. And so we're trying to open that up all the time because if that doesn't get resolved, we're just gonna be going right back to the beginning in circles and having these same conversations and getting nowhere. So what really needs to happen are those really hard conversations. About how can we do right by our ancestors and do better now? Thank you. Um, so, and maybe that is speaking to the fact that we've been siloed for so long in, in the way that we speak, the people that we talk to, um, and we're not as inclusive as we ha should have been a very long time ago. And um, you're right. Uh, I think there's no way out of this without having everyone's perspective and having it um, be thought of equally, not in terms of well, what's, what's the population or how much of these people are represented here or there? Um, that's not equity. So I, I appreciate that perspective. Hal, I had a um, kind of a visceral response as I was watching this, um, seeing the perspective of hunters and fishers. Um, I grew up uh, with a little bit of fishing in my background, but have kind of moved away from a lot of that. And I don't know that all conservationists uh, fall on one side or the other about hunting and fishing. Uh, and the use of wild spaces, but it struck me that 
um, in reading Rachel Carson's um, Silent Spring, she seemed to have uh, worked really hard at um, getting the, the, what they called at that time sportsmen interested in conservation was a really um, valuable tool in making sure that these wild spaces that were used by the people um, you know, got some attention uh, by the public and thus you know, we, we moved against the chemical industries that were polluting DDT and whatnot. Um, so maybe not the most honest way of getting the work done. I know Rachel Carson herself didn't have any beefs with the hunters and the fishers. You know, she was all about uh, biology, but not in a way that she wouldn't harm, harm a living thing. Um, I wonder if you could give some perspective on how this film addresses that and whether you think that's a positive thing or whether it's just part of many narratives. Well, I definitely think it's part of many narratives, um, but uh, I, I host a podcast for a group called Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, and that group's average age is probably 38 or younger. Um, this is the first time we've seen people who are traditional, more traditional outdoorsmen and women, say, uh, hunters and fishermen. Um, step up in such a, a powerful way for conservation. And um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm coming off kind of Pollyanna in this, in this talk here. Like, I'm like, everything's great. You know, I don't think everything's great. But um, uh, hunting and fishing goes back to like 1934 when we did the Pittman-Robertson tax on firearms and ammunition to restore. It's called Restoring America's Wildlife, you know. Um, Hunters and fishermen have been kind of on the forefront of restoring wildlife populations and creating wildlife refuges, which are all funded by the waterfowl, the duck stamp. And so um, that, that population has been dwindling somewhat and aging, and that seems to be changing a little bit. Um, and those folks have kind of the longest track record of success in protecting wild places and conservation and wildlife restoration. And so um, I, we, we don't want to try to do it without them. And I would say us, you know, the hunters and fishermen. Um, and, but there's, there's room for every, I mean, many hunters and fishermen are also bird watchers. Um, there's room for a very large tent here. And the divide and conquer strategy, which so many of us have embraced on all sides of that, the hunters don't like the manatee lovers or whatever, you know, there's these kind of, there, that politics, I'm, I'm, I am advocating for us to put that politics in the rear view mirror and all come together in the Venn diagram of, of what it is that where our intersection is. Um, and and let's, let's have some real wins for like land and water and wildlife. Um, and we could argue about stuff later. You know, when, and I mean, conflict is a, we have a wonder, there's a, there's, there's been a fascinating thing going on about non-game funding for non-game wildlife, you know, like how do you get money for uh, warbler habitat and all that, that kind of thing, you know, because most of the money in fish and game agencies comes from license sales for people who hunt and fish. And we need that conversation, you know, really, really badly. We need people who, mechanisms to fund wildlife conservation and conservation that is doesn't are, are non-consumptive right that don't depend on a hunting license and that conversation is kind of dropped off in the background as we argue over whether hunting is good you know <laughs> yeah i mean i it, it's it's kind of we need we we need to move forward um can i just say with with angelo um one of the things he was talking about was the bear's ears. Okay, so I've done, I'm writing a book on public lands. I've done public lands journalism for 25 years. Um, the bears, we won't, we don't, it's not won't. In order to keep public lands in public hands, and in order for us to have the kind of management and priorities on those lands that, all, that, that will make them the healthiest and most resilient and, and beautiful, um, we need all types of voices in the room. We need all types of, of uh, perspectives and wisdom and, um, and conflict. We need to, we're going to embrace conflict. It's fine. You've got this great asset. People are going to argue over what to do with it. But um, the Bears Ears was the five tribes. It was the model for moving forward on American public lands management and priorities. 
And that made the attack, the rescission of the monument, pretty bitter pill to swallow. And I don't think that was a conspiracy from the Utah delegation to say, we got to nip this in the bud before uh, tribal voices are heard. I don't think it was that complicated. But the attack on the Bears Ears was an attack on all of us moving forward with the tribal voices on public lands. And so the rescission of this monument was doubly insulting to those of us who are trying to find a way forward for the American public lands. I wanted to make that clear because it, it's kind of a big tent thing. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was a pretty bitter pill to swallow. Thank you. Um, I would like so let's to, talk a little. I was, I was just going to add that I agree with Hal on that. I really do think if one monument falls, they all fall. You know, um, it sets the precedent. It gets the the foot in the door. Um, I really love talking to Hal because he just talks to regular folks, both on on side of the, each side of the fence, and. Uh, I think that's rare. That's a rare quality. It's difficult to do. I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to do it with my own native community. And that's, that's rough. It's rough goings because <laughs> everyone is so embedded in what they know and their inability or flexibility to change is, is kind of their own worst enemy. And I think that's what this time is asking all of us to do is really to adapt and change in a way that we've never been asked to before. And sometimes it's painful and it's uncomfortable, but um, you know, it's really the only way now and we don't really have a choice anymore everything's on fire pandemics are raging uh leadership is failing us so we we kind of have to be there for each other and we have to be there for the land because in the end it's the land that's really going to be there for us the um the film did uh spotlight bernadette's struggle with the Gwich'in and uh it was representative, in my, my opinion, of a very powerful voice in the film, but um, it, we didn't see her shouting with rage. Um, and she was telling her story and changing the narrative. Um, and I guess a question I have for the two of you is, um, how do you see that balance of uh, people being uh, indignant and raising their voices and demanding justice versus uh, people that come, come at it from a perspective of, um, personal understanding and bringing others in and saying um, empathize with me because I think there's probably space for both but I want to hear your perspectives on what what seemed to have been um, useful in the struggle because that's that's helpful for us as uh, as climate champions too to understand how do people respond to those various tactics of of trying to move people's minds Angelo, how do you, y'all, there was obvious, obviously a lot of rage around the Bears here stuff, so how did you deal with that? I mean, I think you could see in the film, like, I was trying to keep it together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Hal knows as much as Jeremy and David, the filmmakers, that I am of a younger generation. I mean, I don't back down. <laughs> Uh, I I was, you know, raised back and forth here in San Juan County, and it's a very racist, discriminatory place, even now, especially now, with the whole discussions about Bears Ears. And so, you know, we're no strangers to conf conflict and confrontation, and we've had threats. Our kids have been threatened, and private property has been, you know, hit, and just all kinds of, like, crazy stories that I plan to tell one day in my dissertation at some point, I hope. But people don't know about that they don't see all the low, low key, subtle kind of terrorism that's happening to us. Um, but these other populations that are experiencing this on a daily basis, you're hearing about that now. And it's probably because they're really banging everything, you know, real loudly and setting stuff on fire and making sure people are, are hearing them. And they're not, they're not seeing empty things. Like they're trying to get your attention. A good friend of mine who's not native uh, kind of gave me this analogy. She said, it's like we're on the top floor of the penthouse, the uh, apartment, and like the, the place is leaking like crazy and all the people underneath us are trying to knock up there and get your attention and be like, hey, your, your stuff is leaking into it. Can you fix that? And you're just not listening. You just, you're in your own world. You don't really understand because you haven't been down there. 
And so that was interesting to me because we are really essentially in this world all in the same building, but some of us are a little bit in different spots where our impacts are extremely direct. And, you know, I've, I've thought about this quite a bit about how are we going to move forward in talking in like a respectful fashion and in a productive way. And that's going to be, that's going to be the real uh, um, temperature gauge of how we actually move things forward and how we pro uh, progress progressively move things forward um, is just being civil and having good discussion, having intelligent, but very emotionally and spiritually filled conversations that are substantive and can actually get somewhere. And we haven't had those yet, not in this county, not in the country, not in our, our leadership, you know, and, and frankly, it's, it's time for conservation groups and outdoor retailer people to have that conversation because they've made so many decisions without indigenous input. And, you know, naturally that's, uh, that's, that's no longer acceptable. So we're doing our best to like, you know, uh, trying to um, have a seat at the table and, and be respected and listened to. It's just like Hal said, you know, it's the first time the coalition actually would have a say in the monument making and that is historic, but it doesn't mean anything if it, if you just put it on paper and then it doesn't happen, you know? So uh, it's like any organization, any bureaucracy, we, we have to go beyond that we check it off the list. We actually have to do it now. So um, one of my takeaways from watching this film um, was I was trying to look for the, the climate aspects in the film. And I think they were very subtle, this, um, how this all connects to climate crisis. Um, and maybe that was intentional. Sometimes um, filmmakers want to make a, a, a point in a statement in a way that doesn't alienate certain groups. Um, but there was a line, a line in the film that talked about um, if Anwar was to be in, incurred upon um, that that infrastructure would be in play for another 50 years of um, extracting oil from Anwar. Um, and I thought that was the one place where I really saw the connection in the film where they were making um, an overt connection to climate crisis. Um, can you guys give me some perspective about, um, as far as land management, how you see that struggle intersecting with the climate movement and have you seen support from folks in the climate movement um, for the issues that are near and dear to you and how are we all working together or, or failing to? Um, I, I can, my take on this, so as a, as a reporter or conservation writer at Building the Stream for 22 years, uh, we used to compare, I, I used to compare climate change, the issue of climate change as the, uh, the same as like, you, you're asking people where, what kind of politics do they have? We're not talking about climate change at all. And so um, I have focused on um, talking about resilience um, and in the face of, uh, and, and, uh, and, and regenerate, you know, I, I think that the, the modern woker term is regenerate, regenerative, like you're building, you're building resilience through, through active uh, um, management or whatever. But, one of the things that, that if you're if the public lands offers is a giant space for building resilience and carbon sequestration and all of that. So it this these these nothing, I mean the world is ecological, right? Nothing is separate. You pull one strand and the net moves. Um, but uh, I focused in my reporting on watershed protection and sort of like like the kind of ecosystem services that the public lands were set aside for in the very first place. The, the National Forest System was set aside for that. And um, that's, that's been my take. I, I have been less of a climate change warrior than uh, any, anybody I know in, the, in environmental reporting. And partly that is because some of my, a lot of my audience are, were people, until it's changing, by the way, but until very recently, uh, if you said you were really, really concerned with climate change, they would just say, well, you're a liberal Democrat, aren't you? And from then on, we didn't get anything. There was no, no real cross-pollination <laughs> of ideas. So um, I, I have focused on recognizing the science 
and then saying, if that, then what? What is it actually, what, what can we accomplish right now? Because we have the American public lands as this resource for building resilience in the future as we, as we move into climate change, the inevitability of it for now. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's totally understandable too. I, I, I get that uh, y y you can't alienate your audience, at least you can't do it three times, right? You might, right. might try it once or twice and then realize this isn't working. Yep. And so um, it, it's important to uh, understand your audience and speak to them in whatever way is necessary sometimes. And I'm enjoying seeing that, that uh, debate quiet down as the science becomes more clear to more people, you know, um, yeah. it's it's too easy to assume that somebody like that you're talking to, oh, well, they're never going to get it. Well, people do get it. I mean, they balance checkbooks, they run businesses, they drive cars, they fix diesel trucks. You know, like it's a complicated world we live in. People people will get it eventually. So, uh, Angela, I want to ask this question as sensitively as I can because I don't want it to sound um, obtuse. But uh, we are getting some questions from folks about um, how do we how do we reach out? How do we um, really connect with our indigenous groups? What would you recommend as um, first steps or long term strategies for working with our indigenous groups um, wherever we are? Because not all of our audience today is in Southern California, but we're we're spread out somewhat. Um, but again, and I understand that that's, uh, that's a loaded way of uh, describing it at all. It should not be um, one siloed group saying that, you know, we just want to make, you know, connections, but it's, it is a question that people have. So um, how would you respond to that, Angela? Oh, yeah, you're still here. Okay, sorry, because I know you, we were going to lose you before. And I appreciate you sticking around. Yeah, this will be my last response. Uh, so I just sent a uh, link for um, the webinar that we did of improving partnerships with indigenous communities. So it's a, uh, I think, training resources on environmental um, uh, conservation folks. And uh, I would highly recommend that. It's kind of like a walkthrough with our media orientation guide, but also just uh, focused primarily for conservation groups who are mostly non-native. And um, everybody's different. It's all different depending on where you're at as it should be because they're all different nations, different language, history, culture, background. So you all should have to try to do that research accordingly and make those efforts and extend your hand uh, because the onus can't be on us. It's always on us. And we're maxed out, we're hit by the pandemic, we're hit by climate change. We're wearing several hats trying to keep our nations healthy and, and surviving and um, everybody's at capacity. They're working to stay alive. Uh, and the least that you can do is like offer what you, whatever your gift is, whatever it is that you can do and start those conversations and have those meaningful and authentic relationships that can actually change the world. And that's what we need. And that's part of the reason why now I actually do have to go because at noon, um, our spiritual leader, John Yellowman is, is doing a prayer um, and uh, he's leading this prayer across the nation uh, and Navajo Nation and asking everyone to, uh, you know, have their fires and have their prayers and um, the medicine ready so that, you know, we can fight this, this virus and that we can, you know, fight all of these things that are uh, really threatening our people. And um, that's the major difference between our group and so many other groups is you know, we, we have achieved these things through the power of prayer. We haven't been violent. We haven't, you know, uh, um, tried to like, you know, take um, matters into our own hands. We've included the elders and the, and the kids. And, you know, we've done um, as much as we can with the community. We didn't want this to be like Standing Rock. Standing Rock was unfortunate because people went to jail, people, spilled blood, someone lost an arm, you know, you don't want that on sacred lands. You want to keep your holy places pristine and intact. And you don't want them destroyed. You don't want people hurt. So with that, we're trying to have, you know, one mind and one heart, and we got to go do the work now. I have to An Angelo, excuse me, before you have to uh, shove off here, 
I just want to share one thing with you, a uh, thank you from the North County Climate Change Alliance for your participation today. And we are, we are pleased to present you with this tree, which has been planted in a U.S. national forest in honor of you. So Thanks. We, we thank you. We appreciate the great work that you're doing and for your being with us today. Thanks, thank Carol. you for your time. Thanks, the thanks for the events that are happening today that I'm also a part of with everybody. Uh, thanks, everyone. I got to go. I'm, I'm going to share that as well. Um, your virtual barrier summer gathering event before we leave today. OK, so uh, we've still got Hal. And um, I've seen some questions uh, ripple in, but guys, let's let's get contentious a little bit here. I think Hal said he's ready to, um, you know, let's let's talk dirt. What do you guys got that uh, let, let's challenge Hal? Did you guys see anything in the film that surprised you? Did you see anything in the film that, um, you know, you wanted to hear more of? Uh, I apologize if I'm not seeing them coming through the, the chat. Um, Meryl, you can jump in and tell me if you've seen other questions in here. Um, and also, Meryl, I think that you had a question or two that you were interested in, in presenting. So uh, feel free to jump in with that. But we want to keep hearing from people and seeing what their reactions to the film was and, and hopefully in a way that Hal can help reflect on it. How, what's it like out there? You're in Montana right now, is that correct? I am, yep. I'm about 90 miles south of Glacier Park. So are you guys suffering through uh, worse and worse wildfires? We, we hear a lot about what's going on in the West and in California, but tell us your perspective about how climate change is affecting your, your place there. Well, what, what's happening, we, we do, it's hard to say whether they're worse because we did fire suppression for so long, you know, um, what we have here is, uh, it's, it's painfully obvious, the, the effects of climate change are pretty obvious. I mean, we have, we have much more torrential uh, weather events and less of kind of a gradual, say, snowpack every year. Um, so we've been burning, there's a lot of fires burning right now. Um, and one of the things you'll see is uh, we're, our forest is kind of, um, it's, it's changing to something else, like a, almost a savanna type country, um, or else it's taken it for really long to recover, you know, after the fires. So I think that's what we're we're seeing um, in the change. Of course, I live near Glacier Park, you know, and the the, the retreat of the glaciers is pretty dramatic. Um, and we're very lucky because we had two tremendous snow years um, back the last 2018 and 2019. And they've changed, that's really changed everything. We didn't realize how profound the drought had been until we got that snow uh, with more normal snows, really, you know, um, which involved also our town flooding. <laughs> uh, and it's, 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 a, it's kind of a roller coaster, um, but people who live along here often say that it's always been a roller coaster. You know, um, it's just a lot hotter now in the summer. How about the wildlife? Are you are you uh, and your community that um, that does hunt and fish, and that you know also within the national park? I'm sure there's a lot of people that are just really tracking what's going on with the wildlife. Um, sure. Are you seeing big changes because of climate change, or is it unclear it's, how it's related? I think it's unclear. Um, the the fires, of course, have changed everything because when they when the regrowth, say the lodgepole pine, comes back. It's like 5,000 stems to the acre. And the uh, elk, for instance, can't really get through that. And so they have changed like their ranges quite a bit. Um, and then we've had the blister rust that's killed off the white bark pine and the limber pine, which are five needle pines. And so that, that's been a huge change um, in, in what our forest cover looks like. Um, and that, that was a, both a beetle event and a, and a blister rust event, but the beetles definitely are exacerbated by climate change because the winters don't kill them off. So that's interesting. You just said that the elk can't navigate the new lodgepole if it, if it takes, takes seed correctly. 
and yep. fills in as thick as it's trying. Yep. And then wow. that, that moves them to, to other areas, you know. Um, it's pretty interesting. I actually think that in our three score and 10 as human beings, we have a hard time see, telling what's happening. It's, it's, <laughs> we're, we're all trying to navigate in the blink of an eye when the, when the real plan, when, I don't know the plan, but when the real thing happens at, at, at uh, glacial speed. Okay, so here's a tough, uh, maybe not a tough question, but maybe a controversial question. Um, do you find that a lot of hunters and the outdoors people um, were Trump supporters? Are you seeing any shift in that? Um, no, I don't see a shift in that. And I do see the, the hunting and fishing community uh, is probably majority what you would call conservative, um, both from gun, gun politics, Second Amendment politics, and because um, hunters and fishermen tend to come from more traditional communities where uh, self-sufficiency and bootstrapping and all is, is, is seen as a, a conservative value. What I have seen shift though, is they may be, uh, one may be a Trump supporter, but they did not ask for the destruction of the EPA or uh, they, they, when Donald Trump did the executive action on the waters of the U.S. rule. Um, I don't think, I think people are just now who may be very conservative and Trump supporters are just now realizing what that's going to mean for their, say, lake house or their bass fishing in the south. Um, and I, I, that, that, that is shifting. Okay, so yeah, you're seeing. That, that part is shifting. The, the, the Trump advocacy is not shifting, but what people are demanding or what they're understanding about it is shifted. Right, right. Um, is, are there any voices in, in uh, the outdoors community who are willing to take that stand and say, look folks, this is happening because we have out of control people that are bringing billionaires into the cabinet and you know, they're out there for their money and not for the public goods. I think that's happening, yes. And I think those voices are, um, that's becoming more of a, in, instead of a one outstanding voice or, um, or four outstanding voices, that's, that's rising slowly to a, a, a kind of a, a low hum. Um, right, right. It's pushing, it's, it's Sisyphean though. It's pushing a big heavy rock up a long hill. So um, being familiar with Glacier National Park, um, how have you seen the effects of COVID either uh, bring in uh, throngs of people that are ruining the spaces because they all converged on the, on the national park that wasn't ready to respond to it? Or have you seen it be pretty uh, low trickle of people or what, what's your uh, observations there? So um, Glacier National Park is bordered on the east by the Blackfeet uh, Indian Reservation. And the Blackfeet in my opinion, very intelligently, uh, they looked at what was happening on the Navajo Res, down where Angelo lives, and they saw the, the extraordinary impact of COVID there, and they shut the reservation down to non-essential travel. So that basically closed off the east side of the park. Um, but uh, people sw swarmed in from the west, and we are experiencing on the American public lands right now, the heaviest usage in American history, if you can even get your mind around that, like, like how many people have discovered the public lands for social distancing. Uh, they couldn't go to Florida, to the beach. They couldn't get the place in San Diego. They went to the public lands. And um, right now that's kind of ugly. It's pretty crowded, it's pretty messy. Um, and I don't want to be a Pollyanna again, but I'm seeing a huge constituency of people who are opening their eyes to what we actually have. And um, it, the pandemic has, has done that. And I, I'm, I have, I believe there's a constituency for positive action on public lands, but just from what I've seen. But it's a little overwhelming where I live. There's so many RVs and there's so many people enjoying yeah. public lands <laughs> that's right and i think we lost some of the funding and the support for the uh the people that are running those spaces because we were in uh, let's shut down let's open let's shut down 
Yep. Um, and that got confusing as hell for the people that are running the parks. They didn't have the personnel that they needed to deal with this influx. Correct. Um, the Great American Outdoors Act passed this year, and it is going to deal. Uh, it's going to bring about fifteen plus billion dollars to the backlog of maintenance on national parks, and it's going to bring in one point nine billion per year for National Forest Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Wildlife Refuge. Um, that's for five years. We, we have a window here to really accomplish some great stuff and um, people are going to have to engage though because as this money comes down, um, people, it's going to be like, like do we want to build more campgrounds or fix more roads or do we want to build ecosystem restoration? Um, and I, people are going to have to engage to make sure that this money is spent wisely. I think that was a big surprise to a lot of us to see that happen. Was that was that Trump playing politics of like, well, I'll be a jerk for uh, a number of years, and then uh, him realizing, wow, I've messed messed with people for too long, so I won't resist because he took credit for that, and I I didn't see that as being part of the Trump administration's agenda at all. I th I think it I think it worked fine for the Trump administration in the sense that this is money coming down at this kind of economic stimulus. He doesn't really care where, where that goes, you know, it's just, it's stimulus. Um, but what it was, was politics for uh, Republicans in the West in particular. Um, they could be seen as doing, uh, our Senator Daines here in Montana, could be seen as a person who uh, acted on behalf of hunters and fishermen and, and public land users. And that gave him an up to, to keep the Republicans in Congress, okay? Um, and that definitely was political strategy at its rawest. However, the result is very, very good. And I'm thinking that this cat was let out of this bag in a way that um, it's going to be kind of hard to put back in. Like the next time Senator Daines was asked to vote on, on other public lands issues. And it's going to be pretty difficult for them now to go back and, and say vote for eviscerating the Clean Water Act even more. <laughs> um, something has shifted and I, I'm just, I'm waiting with bated breath to see if, if it's real and if it's lasting. Are, are, you seeing the, are you seeing the public lands movement uh, reaching out to the younger people in Congress? You know, we, we hear about the squad and, and uh, you know, this next generation of people that are uh, really, I think, inspiring to those of us that are looking for progress. Um, are you getting a cool reception, a warm reception from those folks about um, these longstanding problems of not protecting the wild spaces? I think that it, the, the jury's still out. Um, when what we have is um, like Senator Tester in Montana has, is a Democrat. He's been very consistent in uh, conservation and public lands. And then Senator Martin Heinrich has been a, 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 a leader in this for, I mean, he, he's one of the most, the best conservation politicians that I've ever known. The most well, the best informed. He's just, he's really great. There are those, um, the ones that are coming in though, the Republican platform still says to privatize the public lands. Um, and the, the, the more so-called conservatives that are coming in, I don't, I, I don't think they're, they've gotten the message yet. I don't think the American people have delivered the message yet. They're starting to. Right. So we, so we need our mass movement and our climate movement to really combine with that public lands movement. Yeah. Um, well, they're, they're, they're completely connected. Yeah. And actually to those points and also to the points of recent appropriations to public lands as well as getting the younger people involved, here's a question from uh, Susan Wayo, Wayo, excuse me for mispronouncing. The big problem we need to deal with, economic greed, that strikes me as the big divide. How do we bring our interests and the interests of big money together? Ideas? Well, <laughs> um, I think to uh, in the in, in, for for the energy industry in particular, um, and this is this is outside of climate change. Um, our interests could could coincide, but 
you can't just pillage the public lands or, or, or if you're, if you're in the mining industry, um, we should, we should get rid of the mining, uh, the, uh, mining act of 1872 and we should move forward with models of extractive development that don't leave a giant leaching pit in the ground for taxpayers to clean up. Um, we could have done the, the Pinedale, Wyoming gas field, the famous one, the Jonah field, that could have been developed a, a thousand times less impact. 10,000 times less impact, but we didn't require it. And, and industry is, has a bad track record of delivering on, on low impact, expensive low impact technologies that people don't demand. So you can have big money. I don't think you can have greed. Absolutely, but we're always, greed is always with us. <laughs> I, I think you can, I think the people have to put the sideboards and that requires a government that represents the people and is not captured by the industry. Um, I wrote a lot about this in the 2005 through 2007. I, I did not think that the energy industry, for instance, would go so far as to dump produced water from coal bed methane uh, wells into the Tongue River <laughs> just because they had an exemption to the Clean Water Act. I didn't think they would do that. And they surprised me. Um, and which, which argues for when you don't take personal responsibility for your impacts, you need a government that then will put some sideboards on your behavior to protect the downriver users of the Tongue River, which was Montana. I mean, we had irrigators here, like, like they're dependent on the Tongue River. You can't just dump brine into the river, you know? And I honestly, I was, I was, it's too bad because I didn't expect that that would happen and it did. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a reminder to us all that uh, corporations are run by individuals who are not empowered to uh, do what is right for the public. Their, their only um, MO and their guiding responsibilities to do what they think is right in a temporary short-term strategy for the company. To so, the um, yeah, so we, we do ourselves a disservice when we put the trust and reliance on any company to do the right thing in an environmental setting. And um, that's why these regulations are so important because um, like, he, I like that word, the sideboards, we need, we need a way to make sure that nobody goes off the rails. Um, and we've just witnessed three and a half years of the most off the rails uh, you, anyone can imagine. And the, the film did a good job of describing that this did not start in the Trump administration. This, this has been going on for a long time. Alec has been doing this work for years and years. They bought a lot of Congress. Um, and we're, what we're seeing now is just a president that seemed either um, too stupid or just blatantly willing to not hide the fact that um, th these are not things that are good for the people, for our wild spaces. Um, they're just, it's just a, uh, <laughs> a rating of the public spaces. So that's um, pretty horrible, but um, maybe the one good takeaway is we've all seen how bad things can get when we when we put clowns in office. And chaos, you know, it's so chaotic. Um, you never know what is going to be tweeted next. Um, so, but you know, the the, the thing is, it's, I, I don't think the American people and in normally are all that chaotic. Um, I think that we we really want a national forest that has timber and wildlife and water coming out of it for irrigation downstream. If you're just a pragmatist, you know, if you don't even like nature, <laughs> you still want clean water. Um, and uh, I think that there, I, I just think there's a way forward there. Um, one of the things about that regulation too is um, during the Pinedale anticline gas drilling on that, like it's like 10 years ago, um, I won't name the company, but one of the companies actually made an enormous effort to, to be lower impact. And they were doing some really brilliant directional drilling, um, having less well pad, more wells from one well pad, so you didn't have to tear up the sage grouse habitat, stuff like that. Well, it cost more money. And um, they had to quit because nobody else was doing it and they couldn't put themselves at a, a uh, disadvantage, a profit disadvantage by doing the right thing.
And I, I always thought that, I, you know, if we had a regulation that you had to do this type of development at the, at, at the way they were doing it, the, pro, the, the field would have been leveled and all the companies could have complied. Um, I, I'm not a big government person, but if you're going to have a government, that's the kind of thing it would do. <laughs> Yeah, so you just talked about uh, oil extraction and, and maybe trying to do the right thing. And I think from a client perspective, we just have to say like, like right. <laughs> no, no amount of good could come from the extraction, unfortunately. Um, but, but another uh, area that I think uh, a lot in the climate movement are going to want to rely on is the extraction of ore uh, via the mining uh, for things like parts for lithium batteries yes. or uh, you know motors and, and all the electrification that are coming so we can't ignore that mining is in our future uh, yeah. whether it's here or other places have you seen the mining industry uh, react at all in a good way or are they also um, equally bad partners in helping to preserve the, the wild spaces it's I was recently taken to task by some mining industry folks for uh, Say, and, and they were saying that I did not know uh, enough about what they have done progressive and positively in the last 20 years. And um, I actually took that criticism to heart. And so I don't know the answer to your question. I was, I was painfully aware that I was wrong. I, I, I mean, I might be wrong, um, but I had some very respectable folks tell me that I was not informed about the good things they had done in the last 20 years and that I was criticizing them for historical models that have been updated. I'm not sure of that yet, <laughs> right? Um, uh, I, I'm, I am looking into that now. Um, I, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. I do think Some... that, 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 I think, I, I think that the might be Sorry, we had a little feedback there. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. You know, like we, um, if we're going to be honest in our conversations, when people bring things like that to our attentions, we have to go verify it yep. um, and, and at least give them the benefit of uh, looking into what they're um, report, purporting to have done. Yep. And honestly, since mining is so spread out and it's so many different endeavors, um, it would be wrong to categorize miners as either um, good or bad, helpful or not helpful. Um, but I do appreciate that, you know, you're in there in the middle of it and trying to f figure out whether folks are doing the best that they can. Right. Um, I tell you, with, without some reform and regulation, though, it goes back to the same thing with the energy industry. Um, you, you don't have an incentive to spend your shareholders' money on some right. environmentally sensitive thing. You, you Actually, you, you said it best. You can't do that. It's not, you're not allowed to do that. Yeah, and maybe that's... Maybe that's some new rules that we do create is, you know, um, the, this fiduciary responsibility to the, the planet this, and, our, and our climate and the future um, over the shareholders. Because right now it, it's the bottom line and that's, and, and you hear these stories of the double bottom line, but let's be honest, folks, corporations are still driven uh, by money and money only. And until we have a different way of looking at it. Um, we can't put very much trust in folks doing the right thing without the regulation. And uh, speaking of a different way of looking at it, here's a new question that just came in from Patricia McPherson. What is being promoted in Montana per Green New Deal? Do you have any take on that, Hal? I don't. Um, I would. Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure about the answer to that question. Um, I, I, we have a lot of solar and wind development in Montana. Um, but I would say our politics are at a standstill as far as um, as anything like like very active going on. Um, there's a lot going on underneath though. I, um, I have a job that I, I run a crew on the Bureau of Land Management lands in Idaho, and we're planting 185,000 sage and antelope bitterbrush this year. Um, there are a lot of things going on but there is no, that I know of, a Green New Deal coming down with, with, with concrete plans. Yeah, and, and I, uh, 
to help answer your question, Merrill, the Green New Deal's been uh, kind of sputtering because everybody's been so distracted by what's going on with the Trump administration. A lot of what was covered in this film is what the Trump administration has been up to is, is um, really drawing oxygen away from the, the greater discussion of what we're going to do at the federal and state levels. So, um, but there, there is some new motion. Watch for it uh, on Wednesday. The Thrive, Act, uh, Thrive Agenda is coming out. Uh, which is sort of a small step in the right direction to help prime the way for the Green New Deal. So there are still um, actors that, that have not, we've not forgotten about the Green New Deal, but we have to keep reframing it too. You know, we've got COVID, we've got um, new racial injustices that um, are not new, but that are new to people's uh, understanding. Yeah. And so that's going to help frame uh, how we can build a stronger Green New Deal. Remembering that the New Deal uh, was very uh, impractical for a lot of people. It did not help a lot of people. It alienated a lot of people. Uh, and we want the Green New Deal to be a whole lot better and, and uh, you know, be equitable and give justice to everybody. So um, all good stuff. Hey, uh, Merrill, you- the economics you, there in the Green yeah. New Deal. Like, like there is so much money that could be churned and made in innovation and, and uh, alternative energy or renewable energy and restoration of public lands. I mean, I mean, we could have an economic boom with a positive outcome. Um, and I, I wish that I wish that that was more for, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said about the public lands unless the local people in especially you talked about in the West support this idea in the long term, it can't really stand. And um, one of the things we have not done well is to have local engagement on public lands and employment and all and, and stuff like that. We have to address that. And a Green New Deal that in, involved restoration and uh, watershed resilience and stuff like that. I mean, we, we could, the sky is the limit, um, but we have, to, we have to speak to the economics and rural economics is not going well. I'm, here to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's that's an important perspective because um, you know w capitalism and our our uh, American dream narrative um, we know is a, is a is it was a fairy tale, um, and we've collapsed unions. Um, we're not giving support to the working people, um, and so there's definitely uh, we ha we have to come to understanding about where we failed there and i think that's a lot of what everybody forgets that the green new deal is about half climate and half you know economic justice for people um and so uh, that's important stuff to point out um merrill uh, i think we're getting close to our ending time and i think you had something else that you want to share with hal i do uh, not to leave you um out in the cold here hal even though it's probably not very cold in Montana right now. Yeah. I would like to share the following with you as a way of thanking you for your participation participation today and the incredible work that you have been walking the talk on for the duration. And uh, we very much appreciate it. Here's a tree that the North County Climate Change has uh, Alliance has planted. Oh, is that the wrong one? Let me get your tree. <laughs> Just As we saw it here. briefly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here is your tree. And uh, I'll ask you for your um, mailing address at a later time so we can actually send you the plaque itself. So awesome. we sure appreciate it, Hal. And uh, um, we look forward to um, the possibility of seeing you. Uh, the good news is that my wife and I are going to be taking a road trip up to your neck of the woods in late September. Um, the, the better news is that we're not going to be uh, driving in a polluting RV. How are you getting there? We're renting a Tesla, actually. Cool. Wow. So, and, well, uh, it's, that's a beautiful time up here. Last year we had a tremendous blizzard that week, but this year it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Wow. Unseasonal. Yeah unseasonable oh, yeah that's that's probably the most the most beautiful time of year right here so have a good trip thank you very much and if we're in the area maybe we can stop by and hand deliver your tree 
You can. Wow. And, uh, you have my email, so, so Terrific. Keep, that's the best way to reach me. That'd be great. All right. Um, I, I really appreciate y'all having me and um, it, the work that y'all do also. It's like this is the way things are made better. And it's just um, I, I have been so lucky to meet folks in this struggle if you call it that, this, this endeavor of, of trying to address climate change and ecosystem destruction and the, the planetary challenges we have, you know, and they're just some of the best people. I, I, it's just been a great and lucky thing for me as a journalist. Is I got to meet people who actually do stuff that makes a, a positive difference in this world. You know? Well, we think that your um, participation in that film, uh, which obviously culminated from all the work that you've been doing, um, is going to really ch help change the narrative for people and help them understand that this is a big part of what we need to do in our climate movement and our climate struggle is uh, preserve those wild spaces, um, restore those wetlands, as you were just talking about. Yes. Um, and so we, we do, uh, we're very thankful that you were willing to take the time to talk with us today. Um, that you worked on this film, uh, that you're helping to promote the film by talking with us today. Sure. Get that film out there, and more people understand um, how this is all connected. And so, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And thank thanks everybody. Guys. Thanks everybody uh, from our community that came out to uh, talk about this today. I know it's a little different format. We like to actually experience the movie together. Um, but in this times of uh, COVID, this actually made it um, kind of a nice way for me to uh, watch it and take a lot of notes on it uh, and, you know, really study the film before we talk. So it, it kind of works out. And um, Meryl, you shared something in the chat space, or, or Marion did, about extending the ability to watch the film. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, we have extended the viewing uh, window link through tomorrow, Sunday, the 6th at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time. So um, although um, we are not officially um, uh, being uh, asked to sh have you guys freely share the link, it is something that uh, you may want to uh, tell your friends and family about because it's such an important message. Yes, certainly sit down with the family since it's a long weekend anyway. And if you're going to watch it, watch it with more than one person. That's mm -hmm. super helpful. Exactly. So thank you for, uh, I don't know who, who got that put together so quickly. And maybe it was you, Mary. And thank you for who, whoever did that. Um, that's super helpful. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And, and remember that we have the recording. Um, so uh, we will send out some information about how you can view this recording later. Um, maybe this will have another resurgence in a couple months when the film's in major release everywhere and people are watching again. Um, they'll search for it in the internet, they'll find this, and we'll hear more about the behind the scenes discussions, uh, which are really important. So thank you everybody for coming and, and sharing this with us today. Thanks everybody, bye. Good morning y'all, thank you. Thanks for your time today, Hal, really appreciate it. You bet, I enjoyed it very much. Okay. Great. Keep it done.